So Hans Mello is a computer scientist and entrepreneur with a passion for solving world problems using emerging technologies. As a machine learning researcher and practitioner, his expertise lies in reinforcement learning and combinatorial optimization using quantum hardware. In 2018, he improved DOA's QBoost algorithm, winning the Quantum Machine Learning Hackathon at the Center for Creative Destruction uh, in Toronto. Hans co-founded Menton AI to apply quantum computing and machine learning to computational protein design for use cases in the pharmaceutical and chemical industries. Hans is an outdoor enthusiast and Ironman triathlete. Our second speaker um, will be Hussain Sadji from D-Wave. He's a senior scientist at D-Wave working on applications of quantum annealing. Uh, Hussein joined D-Wave three years ago to study many body localization effort effects in quantum annealing and to develop algorithms for training large-scale quantum Boltzmann machines. Uh, Hussein now works with startup companies and researchers to help them solve their problems more efficiently using hybrid algorithms. Uh, his talk, which will be the second part of this, will be about the hybrid solver service from D-Wave. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hans. And again, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A box while he talks. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for the intro. And thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining. I hope everyone is doing uh, well, uh, whatever you happen to be joining from. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, so yeah, really excited to be able to share some of the work we we've been doing, uh, especially around quantum with D-Wave uh, and protein design. So let me just start, um, and I can just go here, by kind of giving you guys a little bit of a context. And just as a general thing, uh, most of the talk would be quite uh, general, a uh, pretty really high level. Uh, but if you do have questions that are more specific uh, in regard to what is protein engineering or some of the quantum optimization methods, uh, feel free to ask in the Q&A and our panelists will try to get to those questions. Or if there is time, I will try to get to those at the end as well. So what, what do I mean by protein design? Um, so let's start with what we mean by proteins. And when we say proteins in the context of protein design, uh, we are not talking about, you know, the, the 30 grams of protein in your protein shake. Um, the kind of proteins we're talking about are the kind that most of them happen to have evolved through uh, evolution through nature over a couple of billions of years. Uh, one example of that is uh, monoclonal antibodies. So these are the, the kinds of antibodies that are in our bodies and help us fight disease. Right? They, they attack pathogens, neutralize them, and act to effectively uh, you know, keep us healthy and strong. Um, so the picture here, the, the structure you see in orange is just such an antibody, which is a protein. And now proteins are in many, many different shapes and different sizes. Uh, and just to give you a, a sense of sort of from a commercial perspective, uh, more and more money is being spent on proteins today. Um, seven out of the top 10 best-selling drugs are proteins today as compared to maybe two or three about a decade ago. Uh, and so the field of uh, drug discovery has a huge interest uh, in developing better, better proteins as drugs. Um, but proteins can also be used in the in industry, uh, in the chemical industry as enzymes. So proteins are essentially little machines that can perform chemical reactions in the form of enzymes. Uh, such chemical reactions, for example, can make agriculture more effective, uh, create new biofuels, uh, transform plastics uh, in, into renewable uh, sources. And so there's also a huge interest from the chemical industry to create better uh, enzymes and move away from toxic uh, metal catalysts. 
Um, now, both of these markets are uh, really, really huge, uh, several hundreds of billions of dollars and growing at a very fast rate. And so this is not just a scientifically interesting problem to solve, it's also a problem that if we could solve uh, better proteins, we could effectively have a huge impact across a number of um, uh, sectors. Um, and so with that in mind, let's talk a little, little bit about uh, the current state of protein design and why we think uh, quantum and machine learning are a key to developing better proteins. Well, so I, I, was, I was saying earlier, uh, proteins um, evolve naturally through evolution over billions of years. Um, now, the thing about proteins is that they're so complex that there's just a huge number of possibilities, okay? So, without getting into the math, if you look at the number of proteins that uh, happen naturally in, you know, in, in nature, whether it's in, in our bodies or in, uh, in just outside in biological systems, uh, those represent a very, very small uh, fraction uh, represented here in yellow of all possible proteins that could be uh, developed. And so, the way protein uh, discovery or protein design is done today by the most part involves a process where if you're lucky enough, you'll go to nature and you'll find a protein that suits your needs. Uh, however, most of the times that is not the case. Uh, however, if you, again, if you're lucky enough, you can take one of those natural proteins and you can evolve it and uh, you in uh, directed evolution, you mutate and you do several iterations of that until uh, hopefully you get the protein uh, that, that, that you need. And that works quite well. In, in fact, Francis Arnold got the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year for, for work on the direct evolution of enzymes. Um, and that helps and that brings us a little bit further out from the, the regime of nature. Uh, which is represented here in blue. Um, now, everything else in gray here, and this is just for illustration purposes, represents the realm of proteins that nature hasn't uh, uh, explored at all. These are proteins that haven't uh, been developed, haven't been sampled, haven't been studied, uh, they just do not exist. And so we argue that Somewhere in this uh, gray space are the future uh, drugs, the, the future uh, catalyst, uh, future uh, vaccine, future antibodies, uh, somewhere out here. Now the question is, how do we go about finding those uh, proteins, right? And just to give you a, a sense of the size of this problem, and uh, there are more proteins in a, uh, protein possibilities in a single 100 amino acid uh, chain than there are atoms in the universe. And that is just the possibilities of a single um, protein, right? And so um, classical methods can really only explore a small fraction of this uh, space. Um, and as it is today, it is a very laborious process that involves scanning or screening through uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, sometimes even millions of proteins uh, in, the, in the wet lab. Uh, these are uh, physical proteins that are uh, <clears throat> tested in the laboratory. Uh, there are some uh, computational methods to aid this process, but by and large uh, have been um, unsuccessful due to a lot of um, computational uh, issues. And really it's only in the last uh, five to 10 years that uh, designing proteins in the computer uh, has even been possible. Uh, but right now as it stands, it takes two plus years uh, 
over $200 million to develop a protein. Uh, and the crazy thing is that out of all the proteins that are tested, it's only a small fraction of those that are successful. Right, so it really is 0.01% success rate, one in about 10,000 now proteins. So it's a very costly uh, and really uh, ineffective, wasteful process for the most part. Uh, and so what we set out to do as a company is to find a better way of uh, not just screening proteins, but actually designing proteins, and uh, designing the proteins we, we actually need. So rather than screening through th thousands, hundreds of thousands, we may be able to design a few dozen proteins and with a much higher chance of actually finding uh, the, the, the proteins we need. And so we uh, developed a number of methods using quantum computing and machine learning uh, to enable us to do that. Uh, and today I'll be talking mostly just about some of the quantum um, approaches that we've been developing, uh, specifically uh, on quantum, quantum annealing for uh, optimization. All right, and so I'm gonna introduce the, the, the core problem in uh, protein design. And I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as, as possible, uh, just being mindful that there is quite a diverse audience. Um, but I guess the easiest way to think of proteins is as these structures that are composed of, of small Lego blocks, right? So if you think of Lego blocks, you can put them together and you can create shapes or little structures. Proteins are very much the same. Uh, amino acids, play the role of Lego blocks, right? Uh, and so in, in nature, there are 20 natural amino acids uh, or 20 Lego blocks, if you will, and we can use those to essentially create the shapes we need, right? The only problem is that creating the shape we need is actually a very, very challenging task. Um, uh, proteins obey a number of, of physics rules or uh, thermodynamics and entropy rules that essentially drive how they actually um, fold and how they end up uh, being rigid as a structure or floppy as a structure. Um, and so out of all the degrees of freedom, um, and by degrees of freedom, I mean the the ways in which a, a protein can move and can rotate uh, its different angles for the different amino acids and atoms, right? Uh, proteins, as a general rule, they tend to fold uh, in such a way that they try to minimize their free energy. In, in other words, they try to minimize the degrees of movement for a protein. And so proteins can be thought of as an optimization problem. Now, um, most, of the, most of the time people refer to protein folding, um, which is actually the inverse of protein design. And so I'm gonna just explain that nuance uh, in a little bit more detail. So protein folding it solves a problem of giving a specific sequence. How would that particular sequence of amino acids will end up folding into a particular structure? Now, protein design solves kind of the opposite problem where starting from a specific structure that we want to um, form, how do we find the sequence that conforms to that, okay? Um, in either case, we're dealing with an with a optimization problem where given a specific sequence uh, following entropy thermodynamic rules, we're gonna end up with a lower, uh, lo low state uh, entropy. And so this is something that has been observed um, in, in nature. Um, 
and it's a general rule that proteins uh, use to, to fold. Um, and this is great because if we're able to quantify these rules, uh, then we should be able to uh, not just predict how they would fold, but in fact design completely new proteins. Okay. And so <clears throat> the concept of a rotomer um, is a combination of the um, different amino acids and the different angles that it can take. So in this representation here, you can imagine how these different links um, can be rotated across a specific axis. Now, what makes this interesting is that rotating one, uh, one amino acid or one angle interferes with how other um, atoms or other amino acids rotate, okay? And so what we're trying to find is the minimum energy that would minimize this, uh, this, this freedom um, to, to rotate. So to take a, a simple example here, uh, we can simplify this problem uh, making certain assumptions um, by allowing, so for example, certain links like this one here or this one on this angle uh, to take two different conformations, essentially two different um, uh, angles or two different amino acid uh, identities, okay? Uh, some other, for example, here uh, can take seven, um, seven degrees of freedom. Now, as you can probably appreciate, as these freedoms increase, so rather than having two amino, two rotomers, or rather maybe 10, 20, 100, um, and having larger proteins, uh, the complexity of this problem uh, just increases exponentially, right? And so this is a kind of problem where classical computing um, has had a really hard time finding algorithms that scale um, well. And so when we think of this problem, um, actually, let me go to the next slide here. Uh, when we think of this problem, it is a combinatorial optimization problem of the kind that should be amenable uh, to quantum computing. Now, I'm gonna go over this slide, which is uh, somewhat technical, uh, but I'll try to keep it uh, high level, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the Q&A. Uh, but the first thing that we want to do in order to convert this problem, this optima combinatorial optimization problem into a problem that we can solve on a quantum annealer is essentially breaking the problem down into its one body, uh, one body uh, interactions, one body rotomer energies, and the two body interaction terms. Okay, now if we're able to do this, then we can have a pairwise decomposable problem of the kind that we can encode uh, as an icing problem or a cubo uh, formulation. And, and so this is here the, 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 the cost function we're trying to minimize. We're trying to find a set of rotomers at each position such that we minimize the the total energy of the of the system. So our cost function, quite literally, uh, in this formulation, would be the sum of the one-body uh, energy terms and the two-body uh, energy terms. Now, one key thing to to keep in mind here is that there are cer certain constraints, right? Uh, for example, we are only allow one rotomer at every specific site. Um, and so we have to account for those kinds of constraints. Um, but once we encode those constraints, um, all we have to do is set a, a param uh, the parameters, uh, how we want to penalize those constraints, 
uh, how many runs we want to do uh, of this algorithm. And with that, we can essentially build a cube or icing uh, matrix um, and essentially just run it on a QPU solver on, uh, on D-Ways um, uh, machine. Uh, now there is a number of ways of doing this and maybe Hussein uh, will go into uh, some details here, uh, but otherwise uh, you can take a look at the, our paper we published um, in a preprint on BioArchive, which is referenced here. All right, um, so when we started doing this, um, at first it was really just a proof of concept. Uh, and so in fact, we solved the, the, the simple problem I showed earlier, uh, where we really tried to just constrain the problem in such a way that basically we could solve it um, you know, classically very easily. And we were in fact able to, to show that the crystal uh, uh, structure solution uh, in fact match what we got out of the uh, the way machine so we were able to show that we were able to translate the problem into a formulation that was amenable to d waves uh, quantum manuler uh, now once we were able to do that we were free to explore much much further and scale this uh, to much much larger problems and so here are just uh, some examples of some of the designs that we created um, so here, for example, is a microcycle uh, peptide uh, that um, does not exist in nature. And actually the, the, the structure of this, the, the, the topology uh, is quite exotic uh, in that it does not exist in nature and is actually designed completely from scratch. And so we now have a, done a, quite a few hundred designs of this sort, created different algorithms together with D-Wave. Uh, some of these designs, like the one on top, I believe have now been synthesized and actually uh, confirmed the structure in the lab. Now, what are some of the potential applications of this kind of technology? Uh, well, this allows us to go into all kinds of areas where proteins uh, can be of, uh, of use. So one area that we're looking into uh, currently is peptides. So designing peptide therapeutics uh, is a very interesting area in, for uh, pharma today. Uh, redesigning, but designing antibodies um, as well. Uh, enzymes, uh, and there's a number of applications within that which I won't have uh, time to go into any detail, but if you are interested, uh, do uh, feel free to ask or reach uh, afterwards. Um, and I kind of wanted to give you just a, a quick sense of how this is um, done in practice, how some of these molecules can be developed uh, in practice. So. Drugs are essentially uh, molecules that drug or attach or target specific uh, proteins in the body, right? And so here's an example of a protein, uh, so a large protein that we want to be able to bind to. Uh, and so what we normally would do is we'll normally identify the site of interest um, either it's uh, regulatory or it has a modulation effect, or really we just want to bind to that protein and it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, but the key uh, thing here is that we're really trying to identify an area, uh, such as this bucket here, in a given protein where we want to uh, essentially bind uh, another protein or a peptide. Right, and so this is what we normally start with, and we start with just a sim simple amino acid here. Now, the what we're trying to do is to create a completely new uh, protein or peptide to essentially go into this little pocket, kind of like a key uh, into a lock. And if we can make this uh, little peptide or molecule really, really well, uh, then we we essentially have us a potential uh, good drug. And so how does this actually work in practice? So the 
the, the, the entire field of uh, protein design, uh, the approaches are essentially aimed at creating a molecule um, to fit those needs. And so our, the approach we've taken is to go from completely from scratch. So rather than taking a, a protein or a peptide that exists in nature, we start by just creating something completely from scratch. And so we can select a specific backbone structure. Um, and then we, we can optimize the side chains, uh, as you can see here, in such a way that they match the, the pocket as closely and as tightly as possible. Now, the, the tighter that fitting is, the, the, the better the binding, uh, the binding affinity and some other properties that are of interest uh, to, to drug developers. And so that is uh, just to give you a sense of how this approach is, do is done. And so given a specific backbone, uh, the algorithm that we run on D-Wave um, essentially finds uh, the best side chains uh, to optimize for this particular pocket. Okay, um, and with that, um, hopefully uh, I was able to, to spark some interest on your side and, and hopefully some questions. I would like to thank uh, our team. So Vikram Mulligan, who is a, uh, a core developer of a, of a protein um, design suite, suite called uh, Rosetta. He is also a researcher at the Flat Iron Institute and a co-founder of uh, Menten AI. Uh, Thomas Gorbe, uh, who is also a co-founder, uh, background in uh, protein engineering, a lot of expertise in um, directed evolution and so on. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of our partners, uh, the University of Toronto, where we got started, Creative Destruction Lab, uh, and D-Wave uh, for um, you know, allowing us to come and present to you uh, today and for all the support throughout uh, the, uh, this process. So, and with that, uh, i hand it over to Hussein and I will wel welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, for the great presentation. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Hussein. I'm a scientist at D-Wave Systems working on applications of hybrid algorithms in science and industry. I'll talk briefly about Leap2, our cloud service that allows you to access a lot of learning materials as well as compute resources and access to the quantum annealing processor. I'll also introduce our hybrid sampling service and what you can do with it and what you can expect from it in the future. Over the past 20 years, there has been a lot of science. We have demonstrated a speed up on specific benchmark problems. Recently, we have shown uh, results that simulation of some physical systems and materials can be done much faster by quantum annealing. Uh, in particular, it can be up to a million times faster. The results are published in peer-reviewed journals such as Science and Nature. Very recently, we have shown uh, the value of using hybrid methods for uh, early commercial applications, and our goal for the near future is to demonstrate the advantage of hybrid computing and quantum annealing um, for, for customers. So, um, so when you think about uh, getting started with uh, quantum computing and building applications, there are a few questions that uh, comes to mind naturally. The first thing is that, what is the value of quantum computing for my uh, research and for my problem? And um, how do I know if I have a problem that benefits from quantum computing? How do I translate my complex problem into a solution that could run on a quantum computer? 
and how do I get it started? Leap2 was built around addressing these questions and help users get started and understand and evaluate the value of hybrid solvers and quantum computing for their problems. Probably the most interesting part of Leap2, uh, at least for me, is the hybrid sampling service. It provides the, an API to a solver that accepts up to 10,000 variables with arbitrary connectivity. A portfolio of solvers use classical and quantum resources to solve complex problems. The type of problems that you can currently solve using the API is called quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, which is uh, you can think of it as an energy function or an objective function over uh, binary variables with linear and uh, quadratic terms. And the goal is to find a set of binary variables or a string of binary variables xi such that the energy or uh, the Hamiltonian or the objective function is minimized. This is a hard optimization problem and uh, it's it's been shown that you can map a lot of NP-hard and NP-complete problems to the optimization of Heising Hamiltonian. So in the past, um, after you um, come up with your business uh, question, you you would have to, um, uh, and then still, you would need to formulate a business question or a research question into an optimization problem when applicable. And in order to um, attempt to answer it, you would have to translate your problem into a BQM, an objective function over binary variables with quadratic terms without any constraints. And oftentimes, these problems in reality turn out to be really large. And so what you would need to do is to decompose the problem, minor embed it into, um, into a graph that is compatible with the graph of a quantum processor. And then you would have to gather all those and uh, find a solution to your problem and then decode it into meaningful results. Now with Leap2 and with the hybrid sampling service, you can uh, still continue doing all of this, but once you get your uh, BQM or binary quadratic model, when you get your optimization problem, you don't have to do all those steps. Uh, there's a hybrid algorithm that does all this process and fine tuning of the parameters for you. In the future, we will have interfaces that allow you to uh, submit an optimization problem in its original format. For example, Menten is using a specific API uh, to solve protein design problems without directly converting them to uh, binary quadratic models. In, you can also find many real examples and templates in Leap2 that can help you get started. You can easily explore uh, examples using integrated development environment. There's a searchable database that allows you to look at specific type of applications that you have in mind and explore um, a lot of options. So with that, I would like to encourage you to get started today. Sign up for Leap2, it's free, and you get one minute of free access to a quantum annealing processor. One minute is a lot. Uh, to sign up, please go to cloud.dwavesys.com website. And with that, I'll turn it to Susan. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Very much, Hussain, and thanks, Hans. <clears throat> We've had quite a few questions coming in and more continue. Um, and I will go through and ask some of the ones that we wanted to have answered live. So Hans, um, question for you. What is meant by free energy of a folded protein? The energy consumption? Well, that is a, a, a loaded question. Um, so the, the first thing to say, so th there are different, um, forces that essentially dictate how proteins fold. Um, but the, the key um, property uh, is that 
if you have a lot of uh, energy in a system, uh, essentially the system is unstable, right? So you can, I mean, think of simple thermodynamics uh, systems. Um, if you have a lot of heat to a molecule, that molecule will, you know, vibrate a lot. And so it's very hard to determine its position, its velocity, and so on. Uh, but if you were able to um, decrease the energy of the system, take away en energy from the system by, for example, cooling it down, uh, you essentially restrict uh, the, the, the motion or the, the complexity of the system. Uh, and so in an analogous way, uh, proteins fo uh, follow a similar route where all the energy that is associated uh, with the system um, is essentially decreased to a local or so a global mi minimum such that it restricts the motion of the different amino acids uh, into its most stable state. Um, so hopefully that, that answered that question. Okay, next question for Hans. One of the main challenges of protein design is having a correct force field. Are you using quantum mechanics-based energy or classical force fields? Uh, right, so we, we use a combination of, of both. Um, so for the, the different force fields, um, elements that go into what they essentially, it's called an energy function or scoring function. Uh, some of those are, uh, adopted from quantum mechanic calculations. Uh, some of them are actually adopted from experimental uh, validation from experimental uh, uh, testing. And so the energy terms that we include are a combination of those and there are uh, a number of different um, energy functions that are used uh, in different terms for force fields. Um, there are still uh, approximations, so there is uh, a lot of room for error there, and so different um, functions, energy terms are used for different problems. Okay, next question. This is really for either of you. The solution out of the solver, I guess, is one possible working option, but there are also other solutions possible, right? Uh, yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. So it depends a little bit on the problem. So for some problems, they are, there is a unique, unique global minimum, uh, and sometimes the the energy landscape can be quite rugged, uh, and so it can have multiple local minimum that might actually be close to the to the global minimum, uh, and so those kinds of problems tend to be challenging in that uh, the system. Uh, is can very often um, fall into those uh, local minimum, right? Um, now, for protein design, generally speaking, um, those wells uh, of the, the global minimum, um, as long as the energy is close to the global minimum, that is often good enough to essentially design a protein. There are cases where some proteins might, might have uh, multiple states that are uh, sort of stable or close to stable, uh, and those can be a little bit more challenging. Uh, in fact, when we design uh, proteins, we actually try to design them such that one specific uh, conformation or one sp specific uh, minimum is preferred rather than having multiple. Um, I, I think that's, that's the question from, from my end. I don't know if Hussein has uh, any more thoughts. Yeah, of course, uh, with uh, most of these uh, solvers and samplers, it's possible to obtain multiple uh, solutions. So it's not just about getting one uh, solution. And also, you know, for, for, for this particular problem, because the goal is to uh, optimize the free energy, it doesn't mean finding the absolute ground state. Finding absolute ground state means optimizing the energy, but optimizing free energy means keep in mind that there are uh, thermal factors in play. And because of the thermal factors, uh, the optimal solution could have a, a high entropy and many possibilities. And um, you know, depending on how the protein design is really uh, pipelined, you might need multiple solutions to uh, 
to get a better screening at the end. Okay, next question. How does the D-Wave implementation compare in computational performance to more conventional methods? Uh, th that, is, that is a bit of a complex question. So there are different ways of solving these types of problem uh, on D-Wave, different types of algorithms that we can implement. Um, so I say it also depends on the size of the problem. Uh, you know, for problems that are small enough to essentially fit on the chip directly, I mean, it can solve very, very quickly. Uh, in fact, you know, what is, what is the annual time, Hussein, for uh, for a simple, simple run? So annealing time, uh, if you're referring to the QPacker algorithm, the annealing time is really a free parameter. And uh, for uh, some of the smaller problems, you can really set it to the smallest value possible, which is uh, at the moment, uh, the, the meaningful one is really five yeah. microseconds. Exactly. So, I mean, if problems are small enough, you can solve them extremely, extremely fast. Uh, as the problems get, get bigger, uh, then it becomes a little bit more challenging and we have to use uh, hybrid approaches. Uh, and so what's interesting is that the, um, the, the latest generation of hybrid approaches are actually essentially giving us results very much comparable to, to the state-of-the-art uh, classical solvers, and in many cases are actually outperforming those solvers. Okay, next question. Can this way of doing calculations be applied to computer-aided design problems? Uh, can you can you repeat the question? Sorry. Can this way of doing calculations, I'm assuming, well, I don't know if they just mean running it on a quantum system, be applied to computer aided design problems? Well, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's exactly what we're what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Has a company come to you with a problem that you have solved, helped with that was not previously possible? I say we're in, in the process of, of doing that. We have a couple of interesting projects at the moment, but I'm not allowed to discuss them, unfortunately. Okay, uh, we'll just take a couple more. And then again, if we haven't answered some of the questions here, we'll make sure we get back to you uh, over email. Hi, does this model include forces and interactions that amino acids have on each other? Or does it just include the physical barriers for calculating and minimizing the free energy? So yeah, it, it includes the terms of interaction between, uh, between amino acids. So that, those are the, the two body terms, uh, interaction between, between amino acids. Yeah. So yes. Okay. And why don't we just take this as the last question. Um, what does it mean to reformulate a problem into quantum to you? Many companies struggle to do that. Namely, how can we look at a drug discovery related problem from a quantum, quantum perspective? Uh, I think I'm going to let Hussein answer that, that question. Yeah, sure, I can help with that. So we have a lot of resources on, on LEAP2 to, to allow you to figure that question out. Uh, we also have a support team to help you with that. And you can always get in touch with people in the application team to let you know how you can do that. Uh, sometimes it's the question of figuring out where the complexity of the problem is. And for example, if you're dealing with a um, sort of complexity that is not really an, a hard optimization problem, uh, we basically let you know and help you figure that out. If, um, if your problem can be mapped to a hard optimization problem, we can also help you figure out how to turn it into a language that the quantum annealing processor can understand. I hope that answers the question. Okay, and here's just another uh, sort of related question, and we can end with this uh, for Hussein. Does the annealing process give you the answer to the optimization problem, or are multiple annealings needed to take the average as a result? I was just about to type answer to that question. Um, it depends on the size of the problem. If it fits on the processor directly, one annealing is uh, enough. But if the problem is larger, you would have to use multiple uh, annealing and multiple uh, uh, machine instruction calls in order to solve that problem. 
Okay, well, there's one more that uh, we're going to answer live and then we're really going to sign off. How to implement all variables in the app to automatic detention of conformational changes due to electrostatics, properties, membranes, composition, and other variables like temperature or molarity? So that is a loaded question. I will re refer them to, to the paper we published in some of the work on, on, on protein design, also from the Rosetta community. Okay, well, that was also a lot for me to, <laughs> to say. <laughs> So with that, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Again, the webinar will be posted to YouTube early next week. Um, we will try and get back to everyone who has questions as soon as we can via email. Um, if you haven't already signed up to get notifications about future webinars, because we do these about once a month, um, you can contact us on our website or we encourage you to sign up for Leap account and opt in for marketing. We promise not to send you much other than letting you know about events and things that might be of interest. So again, thank you all for coming. Uh, Hans and Tomas, thank you very much from our Minton folks. And we look forward to seeing you all at a future event. Bye-bye.